Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, welcome to Making Murals, the Artist Talk with Alice Mizrahi. Uh, my name is Rob Sanagata. I'm the professional, no, I'm not. I am the Director of Digital Curriculum for Davis Publications. I'm filling in for Christy Oliver, our Professional Development Manager to this afternoon. Um, this is our ninth in our series of weekly webinars. They happen every Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., just like this one. Um, and we're going, we've got a couple more lined up through this month. And today we've got Alice Mizrahi with us. She's gonna be talking about her work and giving tips for providing, creating and murals in your community. Um, before we get started, we have a couple of quick housekeeping things. So first questions, we'd love you to ask questions throughout the presentation. The best way to do that is to type your questions into the chat box or the Q and A button that you'll see at the bottom of the screen. Um, so type those in whenever you want. And uh, when we get to the Q&A section, I'll read through those questions and feed them over to Alice who will respond. Um, also, you, you are not gonna be able to talk, but we will know you're there because you're chatting in these, your wonderful questions. And uh, you know, if you have an insightful comment related to something that somebody else asks or that uh, Alice happens to mention, go ahead and, and post that too. Um, we will be recording this session. So uh, if you signed up, which you did in order to get in, you'll get a link to the video, which will be emailed to you um, later on. And it'll also be available on davisart.com slash free resources for anyone who needs to watch it. So, um, That'll be available soon. Great. Yep. Okay, next slide, Tony. All Great. right, so um, just a couple of quick information about Alice. She's an interdisciplinary artist based in New York and Miami. Um, she's an activist and that ideology is weaved into her studio, public art curatorial education practices. She's shown with the Museum of the City of New York, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and the Albright Knox Museum. She's taught at the Studio Museum in Harlem, Brown University, the Laundromat Project, and the Brick Arts, while also being featured in the New York Times, Huffington Post, and Architectural Digest. Uh, she's also a graduate of Parsons. We're really excited to have her here today and to be working with us. Um, Okay, let's see. All right, so our session today is gonna to cover the process of coordinating a mural project, um, such as the process and steps, uh, fostering collaborations with others, people in your community, uh, facilitating the process. We're gonna talk about collaborative murals and how to facilitate them. Uh, there will be a mural project plan and then there'll be a question and answer. Uh, so, once again, don't forget to add your questions into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And as of right now, I'm going to turn things over to Alice Mizrahi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, for the eloquent introduction. And thank you, Tony, for being here and facilitating this conversation for all of us. So I've been, I've been painting a little history, just a quick little history about myself. I've been painting murals now since 2006. Um, I come from the world of graffiti culture. Um, I was born and raised in Queens, New York, and uh, having an older brother and older sister influenced by uh, the subcultures that were emerging then has led me to uh, to mural making um, through through the graffiti through the graffiti movement. And so, um, studying at Parsons School of Design really allowed me to kind of develop some of my ideas around working collaboratively, really thinking about how to engage within my community. Um, in addition to studying at Parsons, I also uh, took classes at the New School, which is um, the new school is, is basically the overarching umbrella for Parsons School of Design. So I studied a lot about social justice and how to implement strategies to really um, work towards uh, implementing um, equitable spaces for all. Um, and that's very much uh, the thread throughout my work. Um, and so mural making to me came very naturally. Um, I started uh, through some friends at first, uh, painting on freight trains, 
Uh, and that's the first time I ever picked up a can of spray paint. Um, at first, it was just kind of like having fun, having a good time with some of the skills I had um, acquired at my university. Um, and so now, here we are about 15 years later, and I'm still painting murals. One of the reasons I love it so much is because it is a process of art making that you could incorporate uh, in a you could you can collaborate on. Uh, I've got a question for everybody that should uh, generate some chatting, and that is, um, what what is your fall semester going to look like? Do you have any idea yet, um, or is everything still in flux and you're trying to figure it out? We're getting different answers to this question from people in different parts of the country. Uh, I talked to some art teachers up in uh, Washington State this morning, and they didn't know uh, what was going on yet. So let, let us know. Oh my. <laughs> oh, there are a couple that, that think that they're going to start normally. That's great. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's very unusual, you know, we're getting to the end of the school year and uh, it would be nice to be able to head into the summer knowing that you don't have anything to worry about and, uh, or having a plan, but it seems like that's going to be a little weird. My, my wife's also a, an elementary art teacher and she's in the same boat. So, all right, Alice is back. Let's test your audio out. Can you, can you hear me now? Yep, that great. sounds good. Okay, hopefully this will be better. Thank you for your patience, everyone. I appreciate it. And thank you, uh, Rob and Tony, for letting me know because I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I was, I was talking about uh, the collaborative mural making process. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to come together, uh, especially now in, in the climate we're in, and really think about our environment and our urban landscape and, and, and just really think about how we construct the world that we live in and what what our surroundings look like. And that's also one of the reasons I, I love mural making is because I go into communities and I'm able to collect data and information and through that data and information from the members and the residents who live in the neighborhood, I'm then able to, uh, you know, worldwide. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to be here to kind of share this process. So one of the first steps in, in developing a collaborative mural, uh, creating it, is to first meet with your clients. So oftentimes I'll get a call from, it could be anywhere from an institution um, or a local arts organization or even a, a school, a local public school. Um, and they'll contact me and they'll say, well, we have a wall that we want to add art to. Um, and we want you to work with our youth or our community or the members in our organization uh, to develop a message that's relevant. And that's kind of the lane I'm in. I develop murals uh, with members of the community that's relevant to the community. So there's a, a lot of murals that go up all over the world where the artist goes in and they paint a lovely mural. And I have many friends who are muralists and do that. But I think what's a little bit different in my process is that I really like to engage the community that I work in. So the first step to do that is you meet with your client or your collaborators. So first you sit down and you have a conversation with the client, the person that's hiring you to get as much data and information and really ask and listen as much as possible. Once you kind of get the vibe and idea of what they're looking for, um, you could then meet with the, the other residents that, that live in, in the community. Um, sometimes, you know, I'll sit down in a setting in like a classroom setting and I'll literally whiteboard some of their ideas. Uh, like I did at the University of Northern Colorado, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. Um, one of the one of the uh, tactics that I that I've learned over the years and that I um, study and um, and implement in my process is something that I studied from Paulo Freire, who is um, a Brazilian educator and philosopher who was a leading advocate for critical pedagogy. 
And the, the process is called PAR, or Participatory Action Research. And what he, he taught was to go into the community that you're working with and to really collect as much data, to ask as many questions, even sometimes um, create forms um, that allow people to really think about what they'd like to see, what message they're trying to implement in their community. Um, and, you know, I can steer the conversation as a facilitator, but oftentimes in that process, I'm really collecting data and learning what the environment and the neighborhood is about, what their core values are, um, and what they'd like to see. Oftentimes people in neighborhoods want to see positive messages in their communities for their kids, for the elderly, for themselves, because, you know, it, it's, it's more productive. Um, and again, they live in that neighborhood, so they want to see messages that make them feel good. Um, so I, I encourage you all to look at Paulo Freire and his pedagogy. Uh, he did write uh, the book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, I think it's a really, really perfect time to read some of his literature. Uh, he's really a master, uh, master educator, in my, in my opinion. A lot of his um, teaching strategy I implement. Um, so the, the next step after collecting data is I go to my lab or my studio, um, or sometimes it's a hotel room. Um, like, you know, I just did a, a mural project not too long ago in Worcester and, and, you know, I was staying in a hotel. And so the lab sometimes is ever shifting and changing. As long as there's a table, I have my mechanical pencil and eraser. I sit in the lab or the studio or the hotel room and I start sketching based on all of the information I collected. And what that does is, is allows me some time to really download and process all of the information that was just kind of funneled into me. Um, and by getting it out on paper, I'm then able to develop a more cohesive sketch based on um, the information that was shared with me from the community or from the students. Um, after I put down some ideas in my sketch, I present a sketch that's somewhat complete but not fully complete because what happens is, is oftentimes I'll have to go back and add or edit based on the feedback that I get from the presentation. And this is a really important part because you can gather the information and maybe put in as much information into the sketch as possible, but maybe you're missing something or maybe you didn't capture something accurately. And so you need to go back to the community or to the people that you're working collaboratively with and really ask and present and round table it, you know, sit down and be like, okay, this is what I came up with and literally sit there with the sketch and make notes on the actual sketch. Sometimes I like to make a photocopy so I have uh, multiple iterations of, of the process. Um, and I get feedback. And from that feedback, I'm then able to go back to the drawing board and revise my sketch. Now, it's really up to the facilitator or the artist to determine how many times you have to go back and forth with, with the community to kind of get a, a green light for the sketch. In a mural project I did with the Department of Health, we had about five back and forths. And that was because each session that we were meeting with, we actually had a, a class lesson that was that was um, able that that allowed me to collect more information for the sketch, um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. After presenting the sketch, getting feedback, and getting a green light, then I sit down and start thinking about what the materials look like, and I consult with the community or with the students or with the collaborators on what colors they'd like to see within the sketch that we develop. And so based on that conversation, I order supplies. And so the key is, is that you always become the person who is going back and consulting or asking or um, checking in to, so that everything is transparent, that the, the people who are working with you, your collaborators are part of every part of the process. And this allows the community you're working with or your collaborators 
to really own the project. So you just become someone that is facilitating, creating a space for that, in, that um, engagement to happen. Um, and I find that it is really, really amazing when um, the process, the, the, um, the community members are engaged throughout the whole process. Because then when I'm gone, that mural becomes their mural. I'm just the artist that came and helped make it happen. Um, so this, the, the materials come, or if, you know, sometimes some of these conversations can be done on Zoom, like even collecting data, they can be done on Zoom. Like I know for a mural I did in, in Worcester, I had to have three Zoom sessions before um, I actually came to the, uh, to the wall to, to start painting the mural. So there are, you know, you don't have to actually be, you know, in front of, of your collaborators, you can uh, do it digitally as well, um, which is important now because most, most of us are working digitally because of the pandemic. Um, so the next step would be to order the supplies. And then after that, um, making sure you have like a really, uh, a really um, developed and thought out timeline of what your process or your project is going to look like. And this is kind of a behind the scenes thing where you're laying out the timeline of, okay, this is the day I'm gonna meet with my collaborators. This is the day I'm going to do a workshop that's going to possibly allow me to collect data. This is the day I'm gonna be uh, drafting up the sketch. This is gonna be the hour I present the sketch and get feedback. And then ordering my supplies will take how long? And then me actually getting to the wall. So by the time I get to the wall, I'm fully prepared. I have done all of the work I need to do. Everybody knows what's happening. Everyone's on board. And most of the time I even share the timeline so that we can all hold each other accountable. And this ranges from, you could do this from middle school to senior citizens. When you share a timeline, and most of you know this because you're teachers, um, it really allows people or, or the students to understand the scope and what like the container that it's starting and ending. Um, and so that's even helpful for me as an artist to know when things, the timeline. Um, so I paint the sketch on the wall and that, you know, you could have the collaborators be there to watch you paint the sketch. But for me, oftentimes I like to get the sketch down alone just because I feel like I can really focus, spend three hours, get the sketch on the wall. And the next time we meet, they are then there and helping me with the next step, which would be um, the fill, right? And even in graffiti culture, when we have our outline of the letters, right? We then, the next step would be then to, or the sketch, the next step would be then to fill. And so the fill is basically the whole inside of the line sketch, just like a coloring book style. Um, and, the and you can assign community members or collaborators to fill in certain areas. For example, uh, I just did a project with Rock Paint Division in Rochester, and the wall was about, I don't know, 80 feet long, and I had 10 students on the wall, and each student had their section of the wall, and it was like body, it was a little wider than your body so that no one was on top of one another and everyone had their own space to paint. Once you have more than 10 students or collaborators on a wall, it gets very tricky. I don't recommend it. I think if you have a class of 20 or plus students, the, a good thing to do is to have 10 of them document the process and the other 10 work on the wall within their body space. Um, and that really allows them to take charge of that space. Um, at the end, after I fill, of course, we, you know, we have multiple sessions where we fill, we add detail. Sometimes I bring in stencil patterns so that shirts um, or pants or clothing items can be filled with texture. Um, and I find that students really love that because it's another technique for spray painting. Now, if you're not spray painting and using, acryl using acrylic, you can still use stencils with those foam brushes. Um, so either way, whether you're filling with brush or filling with spray paint, um, you, can, you can use that process. Now, if you're using spray paint, it's, it has to be outdoors. There's no spray painting indoors for my practice anyway. 
um, because it's, it's, it's toxic and you don't want um, your community to, to be suffocated with all those fumes. And it is critical that, that whoever is working on it, if you're using spray paint to wear a mask, and if you don't know how to use spray paint, I recommend that you team up with an artist who does because it's, you know, you need to know some technical, some, you know, you need to know the technicalities of how to use a spray can. Um, and then after that, after we've done all the touch-ups and everything, you, you'll have the unveiling. Now the unveiling is important because it sort of congratulates the community on the, the, the project, right? It gives everyone a, a hurrah, good job. Um, and so you want to be able to celebrate the culmination of that project. Um, so oftentimes we'll have a ribbon cutting and we'll have food or drinks and someone will be there to present um, whoever, whoever the organization is that, um, that sponsored the mural. And then I'll be there as well to, you know, to say some words and, and congratulate the community who, who participated. Um, so those are the basic steps, like, you know, the framework. Um, so next slide. Okay, so, so this is an example of a mural project I did in, um, in Buffalo. I collaborated with the Buffalo Center for Arts and Technology Youth. It was a high school youth program and the Albright Knox Gallery. Um, and it was an amazing collaboration. Um, I spent about two weeks there um, and it was lovely because the students who were participating with in the program were already, um, in, you know, they were interested in, in the arts and for them painting with um, acrylic and also painting with spray paint was like a big, you know, it was a big discovery moment for them. And you'll find that, that when you're working on a wall, you're working larger than life. You're using your whole body. It's almost like a dance with the wall. It's very different than drawing on a piece of paper, which is way more intimate. This becomes very physical. You're getting on a ladder, you're getting on a lift. And those are other things to consider. If the wall is really high and tall, you want to first think about in your planning stages, are you going to be getting on ladders? Are you going to need a lift for this wall? Ideally, when you work collaboratively on a mural, the wall should be a wide wall as opposed to a tall wall. It is harder to fit people on collaboratively to work on a wall when it goes tall. It's way easier when it's wide because then each person could just stand next to each other. Um, I find that, you know, getting on the ladder is a little tricky. You really have to be careful for safety issues. And also on a lift, there are certain things, uh, clearance you have to get from the sponsor that you're doing the mural with. So this, this mural is called Dream Keepers. And these students came up with the idea because they said that the, um, we had multiple conversations and we did a few lessons. And they said that the east and west side of Buffalo was very divided racially. Um, and they wanted to paint a mural that showed um, some em embrace, some sort of love and embrace for their community to kind of bring the East and the West side together. And so collectively, we came up with an idea of a biracial couple um, that where, where the man was very introspective and he held a key in his pocket to symbolize, um, you know, kind of that, 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 um, that marriage, not that traditional marriage, but that marriage between a uh, people loving each other, no matter what the color of their skin was. Now in her hand, they wanted something to show growth for the next generation. Um, and there were a few kids who, who identified with being LGBTQ. And so the, the rainbow on the side, and then there's uh, uh, two people holding hands walking through the rainbow. Um, so, and then the flowers also, they really wanted to think about nature and mother earth and embracing. So all of these conversations that we had based on our three lessons that I gave them, which were all free writing lessons led to this sketch. Um, next slide, Tony. Alice, can you tell people how, how tall the highest part of this particular mural is? Sure. It's about, I would say, um, I think it's about, it's three stories high. So I would say it's about 60 feet high. And you could see the, the um, 
you know, you can see the, the massive, <laughs> the massiveness of the wall based on the, the kids r rolling up or filling in the shirts, right? And so in this particular mural, they couldn't get on a lift. It wasn't allowed. So I was challenged with, you know, having to create enough space for them to fill on the bottom and me really focusing on doing the top part. So in the evenings when they weren't there, I was quickly painting the top part of the wall and they were filling in in the daytime. What I like to do is create three hour chunks. Any more than that, it's, it's too much. It's, it's tiring, it's really physical. So I like to get the, the collaborators of the students for no more than three hours. And that really allows them to open up the paint cans, mix the paint, lay out all of the tarps, and, um, and really think about the whole process in which we have to set up before we even touch the paint. Um, and then I, you know, I teach them techniques, like what does it look like when you take a roller and have three different rollers with three different colors and literally start to drip your paint on the wall and watch all of the colors melt together. That process for the students becomes somewhat mesmerizing and also very freeing because in schools, sometimes we're taught not to be so messy because we're inside of a space and when we're outside, you can be as messy as you want, right? Because you're not, you know, you could throw paint at the wall, literally, because you're not in a classroom. So this process is very freeing. And I would recommend for all the teachers that are going to um, embark on painting a mural that you really allow room for experimentation with the paint, right? Like you can always paint over and go back to it, but really allowing the, the students to um, discover the way paint moves on a wall that's vertical. Usually we're painting flat or drawing on our table, but when it's vertical, there's a different kind of relationship to it. Um, so again, this was at the Albright Knox Museum, Buffalo Center for Arts and Technology, 2016. It was a mixture of spray paint and acrylic on, on a wall. So yeah, and we, they titled it Dream Keepers because they wanted to think about, um, you know, how, how their community can keep dreams that they have for the future. There's a quick question. We're getting some technical questions. So it seems like we should just answer them right now. But um, one is, do you put a sealer on it? at the end or at the beginning. And then the other question is, how do you prep the walls? They both came in kind of at the same okay, time. Okay, great. So those are two great questions. So um, if the organization I'm working with has the capacity to prime the wall for me, I let them because it is a big task to prime a wall that big. If they have the capacity to prime the wall, then they do. If they don't, then I let the kids do it. It's a lot of work to prime a wall. And if um, your wall is really large and they can't get on a lift, you have to make sure that that's something you ask the person who is sponsoring the mural. How, who's gonna prime the wall? Is the janitor gonna prime the wall? Are you gonna hire painters to prime the wall? Because as the artist, I wanna keep my energy for working with the, in the collaborative process and also making sure that the wall looks beautiful. Um, so prime the wall with white, it's called Kills Paint and it's a white primer. Um, at the end, you could, you could seal it with something called Cortex to prevent it from, if anyone you know, tries to spray paint it on it, it's just, you, know, you can easily wipe it off. Um, I have had situations where walls get tagged and you have to go and, and clean them or fix them but that's just part of the ephemeral quality of painting in public spaces. Do you use a different product to seal inside than outside, Alice? Yes, the, in the interior primer is called Kills, K-I-L-L-Z, and the exterior is called Cortex, and it's a clear sealant. And again, that should be applied at the end by the person who primed the wall. With a roller, it's fine. Does that answer those that, those cool. Okay, cool. So can we go can we go to the next slide, Tony? 
great. Okay, so this, this mural is titled Your Whimsical Dream. And it was created with, this is a mural that was created with the university. So the university contacted me. They had seen me speak at a, on a panel discussion about public art at College Arts Association, which is um, an annual gathering of college, uh, college professors. And they had called me and said, you know, we have a museum in our community, uh, the Railroad Museum, and we have students that want to do a public art project and we want you to facilitate it. And so of course I asked a bunch of questions and then I went there and we developed a sketch. Before I arrived there, I made sure that the students had information about what, like, what they needed to do research on. So what I did was I put together a one-sheeter for them asking questions about what they would like to see on their, in their community, on their wall. I asked them to think about historically how, and this is placed in Colorado, in Greeley, Colorado, historically what, what happened in that town or how they can weave in a historical narrative into the conversation. Um, so when I arrived, they had a ton of research. Um, and so again, we whiteboarded, we brainstormed, we did um, the method of participatory action research. Um, I came up with a sketch um, we revised it twice. Um, and then, of course, the Railroad Museum is also part of, the, part of the process of asking questions. So what we did was we went to the director of the Railroad Museum and we asked her, what would you like to add to this mural? And she said, well, we want to add our, our slogan, educate, inspire, and create. And so we said, okay, we'll weave that in. Now, this is a tricky thing because if you're working for a client that's corporate, it's different than you're working for a nonprofit or an organization. Oftentimes a corporate client will want their logo on the wall, but a nonprofit or someone who is an educational institution won't ask for a logo. And most likely you shouldn't agree to putting anything that's marketing or selling anything because you're really thinking about creating a mural that's for the people, by the people and placed in that community that's not trying to sell anything to that community. Um, and that's a really important, uh, a really important part of, of creating within, within uh, community uh, settings. Because you'll piss people off if you, if you put on a logo and, you know, and, and you're trying to create a positive message and then sell them something at the same time. Um, it sort of contradicts. Um, so, uh, so once we, you know, once I got up the sketch, they came in, did the fill, and the same process. Um, Tony, can we go, can we move to the next slide? Great. So again, this is a picture. So throughout the process, again, if I can't have all of these students on the wall, because there's more than 10 of them, I'll have most of them either take video, take um, pictures, because I'm painting and I'm facilitating. I don't really have a lot of time to take pictures and to take video. So I give them the task. And this way at the end, we have enough um, uh, marketing materials to be able to share with our community the process of, of the mural that we created. Um, oftentimes institutions love that because if they're trying to raise funds to do more public art projects in the future, these tools are necessary to show how the project succeeded and what the process was. So I encourage you for those teachers who um, have very little budgets and do a mural, take as much photos as possible because in the end, they'll give you double the amount of budget based on the impact that it will have. They'll see it will have such a great impact that those photos um, will, will help you, you know, gain more funding. Um, so yeah, so that it, they wanted to call it your whimsical dream. Another uh, point about this mural is that they went out into the community and asked everybody that lives in the surrounding neighborhood what they would like to see on that wall. And so that was also part of the um, development of the sketch. And that's great to do with students, right? What does it look like if you ask your students to go around your school community and ask other students what they would like to see on their wall? It really allows people to feel like they participated, that they owned uh, that space and that process. 
Um, yeah, so next. So, okay, so this project was a massive project. This was a year long project with the Department of Health in New York. Um, the Department of Health created this program called New York City Mural Arts Project. And it was a project that, um, that uh, the, the government, the mayor in particular, wanted to do something in New York that destigmatized mental health. Um, and so it was a wonderful opportunity to work and really bring communities together that normally might not sit at the same table um, and in one neighborhood and, and really think about uh, something that's a tough conversation to have. Um, and so what, we, what I did was I had nine months to a year um, of workshops where I went to a mental health clubhouse called Venture House in Staten Island. And I worked with um, a group of 10 to 30 uh, mental health um, patients or mental health peers as we call them um, to develop ideas around what can destigmatize mental health or the ideas that people have around people who are mentally ill. Um, and we came up with a bunch of ideas. Um, some of the workshops included mask making. Um, some of the uh, workshops included conversations where they had to write in their journal about what health felt like to them. So we really unpacked the conversation and it would, I learned, and this is something else as a facilitator, that you really have to be a student as well in this process because you're the person that's collecting all the information and making it stick. You're, you're, you're providing the glue. Um, and so by listening and learning, you're also part of that integral process of understanding what you need to do in order to implement this mural that's going to be in public. Um, can we go to the next slide? So one of the, um, you know, so the first thing, so we had 40 minute long sessions in each class and what we would do, and I didn't know this community, I just met them. And so one of the first things we did was we just did icebreakers, for, took about 15 minutes out of our session, um, just to kind of get warmed up to get to know one another. So some of the icebreakers were like, what's your favorite food? Um, can you create your name, you know, have an adjective before your name as you're presenting who you are to me. Um, and every week that we met, we did a different icebreaker. And that really allowed us to kind of come into the space and understand that, okay, now we're moving into this art conversation that's going to implement change around mental health. Um, and so some of the discussions that we had on the topic were really based on how do you empower yourself as someone who is diagnosed with a mental illness? How do you get other people to see you in an empowered role? Um, what is personal empowerment? So really asking questions that are somewhat difficult um, and listening. Uh, what encourages empowerment? How can art, art help foster recovery and empowerment? And so these were worksheets that we developed um, in addition to kind of uh, having those roundtable discussions and really unpacking that. Now, every time we had our discussion, right alongside it, right after it, we had a visual arts lesson. Um, and so if one of the questions was, what is, what is your identity or how, what do you identify with, then the art lesson might be mask making. Or if one of the, um, one of the discussion topics was, um, what what makes you feel healthy um and then we would do something like one of the ideas was we did a tree quilt where each word was a different empowering word of how you wanted to feel when you uh when you were at your best um so those are some some ideas um can we go to the next slide i don't know if the next yeah okay so so the, so they came up with the idea of we are all connected right? Um, we are all connected. And the way they came up with that idea was um, they, we, we had a conversation about being a superhero and how they felt oftentimes like they had uh, superhero qualities because they were different and in, in society they weren't ex um, accepted, but that they felt like sometimes the qualities of their mental illness allowed them to kind of um, excel in other things. 
um, so that they felt like superheroes. And so, you know, in that we, we thought we talked about, well, emotions and what does it look like if you're a superhero and your face is divided in half and one side is your best and the other side is, is, is not your best, is that place you're struggling with. And so in some of these, in, in this picture to the right of Sandra, you'll see her mask on one side is kind of very serene and quiet and the other one is very colorful. Um, and so we talked about what it is to be your best self and how to get to that place. So on the left, you'll see mask making was one of the art activities, a letter of gratitude. I had each um, participant write a letter of gratitude to themselves um, and to someone that they love and to someone that they have difficulty with. Um, we also engaged in some watercolor techniques um, and we also did some calligraphy, which then allowed us to then go in and develop some affirmations using both the watercolor and calligraphy techniques. So alongside of some of these discussions, we were also developing um, techniques to be able to facilitate the art making process. Um, and they loved it. For them, it was very therapeutic to be able to discuss some of these very deep seated hard conversations about uh, their, their suffering and their pain, and then being able to put it out onto paper um, through the process of art making. Um, and I find that similar to these mental health peers, that students also, um, classroom students between the ages of middle school to college, they also have issues that they deal with where art becomes somewhat of a therapy for them. Um, and tapping into that is really, uh, I think, important. Um, so one of the mental health conversations was, who are you, your identity? Um, you ask them to identify your emotions through facial expressions. What makes you feel uplifted? How do we cope? Um, and then through those questions, again, we implement that into the practice of the art activities. Um, so next slide. Mural development update. Okay, so what are some, some of the key words we can add to the mural based on the discussion about empowerment and what public images make you feel empowered? So once at the end of every art activity, we had a development update of, okay, don't forget, this is the big picture. We are, after these 12 sessions of art activities, we are painting a mural. So let's check back in to see what the update of the development is. Um, and then these are some of the questions I would ask. Again, collect data and then be able to be informed for the next step. So on the right, you'll see the process of the completed sketch on the wall. Now these are a little bit different than actually painting on the wall. These are panels that were painted um, through uh, with the community, with the mental health peers, but then also with students that we put together so that the conversation around mental health could, by, by putting those two people in the room together, it can naturally be destigmatized because we're all looking for one goal, which is to complete a beautiful mural in this school setting. Um, so by integrating the mental health peers and the students together to, to focus on a project and an end goal, we were then able to destigmatize within that community um, mental health or the ideas of what mental illness looks like. It was a very, very empowering um, mural. Um, what we did was we decided to create mural pieces and put uh, different, um, what, they, what they wanted to do was show that we're all different, but we're all connected. Um, and each fruit on the tree actually was a different affirmation that they had wanted to add in, in English and, and Spanish to um, be bilingual. And some of the students in the mural depicted were also the students that were working on the project um, with the peers. Um, so I encourage you, if you have an opportunity to take your community and mash it up and really kind of have tough conversations, today would be a great time to have conversations about race and equity um, and the disparity that kind of comes in, in in, in today's world, right? And we're really fighting for those justices. What does it look like if you put all of those people together and come up with an idea? You not only have a mural that impacts your environment, but then the people who participated in it. 
So that's a lot to take in, but th that, that was that mural. Um, and so let's go to the next slide because I know we're at our 45 minute mark. Um, so the reflection process for this mural was at the very end, you know, you listed five things that empowered you. Um, and you can also discuss how gratitude leads to a strong sense of um, self-empowerment and how you can help facilitate that on your own. Um, and this was great because it allowed uh, the community to really kind of think about how they can um, implement things into their daily lives that help them feel at their, at their, at their best. Cool. So, so can we go to the next slide? Cause I think there's a final photo. Yeah. So this was created with Swanson Road Intermediate School, Sarah Connell, who was the teacher who brought me in to paint this. Um, you know, it, it's really wonderful when you're working with a, a teacher in the school, like I was coming in as the artist and then there was a teacher who was helping as well facilitate it. She had, uh, a, she had asked the students to research me before I arrived. And she also asked the students to come up with some ideas. But then in conjunction to all of that research that they had done, she had also asked them to document the whole process. And so this video was created by those students at Swanson Road. Um, and I think that's super empowering because now the students have this little video, this little time capsule that they documented of their interaction with me and, and their, their, their engagement in the process. Um, and I think, you know, if you have more than 10 students that you're working with or 10 collaborators, that is a great way to occupy those other 10 um, or those other 20. Um, so oftentimes I'll have the students create a video or some sort of video uh, um, uh, photo diary that allows us to have um, something in the future that we can share. Um, yeah, so we, they named that wall Gaia, Mother Earth, um, and it still lives on that wall and those students will never forget that engagement. It was really uh, an amazing process. So next. Questions. Oh, okay, we're done. So, well, we're not done. We have questions, but <laughs> so basically, um, go ahead, Rob. Do you want to? Yeah. Yep. We've got some questions ready to go. Um, we've got three right now, but everyone else, please uh, add them in the chat or the Q and A. So, uh, here's the first one. Have you ever done any collaborative murals with elementary age students? Yes, I have. That's a great question. Um, so, you know. I would recommend if you're from, you know, it's really challenging to do it with like K through two, right? I would say do it from third grade up. Um, and if you're doing it with elementary school students, you really want to make sure you do a lot of prep work before. You want to make sure the tarp is laid down. You want to make sure all of the paint containers and everything is already pre like arranged. Everything on the table is all of the colors that you're putting in whatever area you're putting in, you're almost making it like a paint by number for them. And with that, that just allows less confusion. Um, and when you do it, I recommend that you have like another adult on site because you will need somebody to help with the brushes when they're dirty or you just want to make sure that there's more than your eyes um, helping facilitate that. It could even be a high school student who interns. Um, and so you really, for that, young elementary school, you really want to prepare everything in advance when it comes to the painting part. You can still implement the um, idea and the sketch phase with them um, and they can develop it and you can assist them through that. But for the painting process, you really need to make sure everything is kind of laid out for them. Great. Okay. So the next question, we've got a uh bunch of technical questions coming up. Um, yeah, for sure. But first, do you have a resource for learning about spray paint technique? Hmm. Let's see. That's a great question. I don't have one offhand, but that that is great because perhaps I need to make one, right? Maybe a video about about how to Right. I, I don't I don't offhand have one, but I think if you Google or you YouTube, you can um, you can find some resources how to how to. But but thank you, because I may perhaps I will create one so that, you know, 
that need is filled? So we've had a couple of different questions um, about the type of paint. Like, is there a particular brand of spray paint or um, that you use that lasts for a longer period of, of time, maybe if you don't have the opportunity to seal it? Uh, and if you're not able to use spray paint, what kind of paint would you recommend for painting outdoors? Great question. So, okay, so I like to use Montana 94 paints. They're very easy to use and they come in a wide array of colors. It's kind of the top of the line for spray paint. Any Montana paint works really well. I recommend Montana 94s because they have a really nice, uh, the, the can control on them is, is really nice. It, they're easy to paint with. Um, Belton, B-E-L-T-O-N is also really good. And so is Molotow. M-O-L-O-T-O-W. Um, if, uh, if I were painting a mural for the first time, I would definitely use Montana 94s. Um, and then the second question was for the regular paint. Um, I like to use golden mural paints. They're expensive, but they're so worth it because um, they don't fade, the colors don't fade. I wouldn't recommend just using any acrylic paint if you're going to use, if you're going to do an outdoor mural, it will be affected by the sun. So you want to make sure to use an outdoor mural paint. Uh, Golden makes the best one. There are others. They have exterior uh, mural paint. And, you know, and the other thing, if you don't have a large budget and you don't want to buy um, the golden paints or, 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 you know, it's not part of the budget, you can also just use exterior bucket paint, like house paint. Um, and that's what I used for years. I just, you know, I still use it actually, exterior bucket paint. And you really want to make sure it's exterior because it's made for the sun. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. So next one. Um, have you ever collaborated with another artist on the design aspect or do you usually work with the client and collaborators individually? Yes, I've worked with artists to, um, both collaborating on the design process and collaborating on the actual mural. Um, I've done multiple collaborations. I do a lot of work around women's advocacy. Um, so I've collaborated with a lot of women artists, um, painting murals. And uh, one time I collaborated with a woman who does these crochet murals, her name is Olek. And so we came up with a design and then, you know, she did her, she added her crochet elements and I added my painterly elements. And I think it's great when you can collaborate. If you have the possibility to collaborate with another artist before you do it with a group setting, I think it's really a great step because you get to really see the point, some of the things like a trial and error period of what you have to do. It, it's not all about you in a collaboration process. You really have to be able to detach from the, the, the product. Um, you know, when I'm painting my own mural, it's all about what I want to paint. Or, you know, if I'm painting it in a space, I oftentimes I like to paint murals that are relevant wherever they're going. So I tend to ask a lot of questions, but it's then it's mine. I painted it. But working collaboratively, you kind of need to let go a little bit. So I would say um, partnering with another artist is a great way to kind of take a step towards that. Okay. Uh, we also have a couple of questions about if you're painting indoor um what kind of paint do you recommend that would last a long time yeah so painting indoor you could use any acrylic paint i you know i like to use golden they're the best paint so uh, for me anyway they're the best paint um i like to use the fluid acrylics because the ones in the tube if you're working with students or even uh you know whether they're uh, younger high school or elementary or even uh, college, college uh, students, you want it to be as easy as possible. So what I always do is I, I order a bunch of those Chinese food containers. Um, so I have those right off that, off the top. Those Chinese food containers are great because what happens is, is you can close them. So you're not wasting paint at the end of the day, right? And if you have a color that you know you need a lot of, you want to mix a lot of that color before you even start because it's very hard to match the color again. So if you have a large area, if you're advising your collaborators, 
you want to make sure that they make enough paint or they mix enough paint or that you mix enough paint for them to be able to fill that whole space. It's always better to have extra in the end than to be short. Because then you're going to spend about 15 minutes make, trying to mix that color again, and you won't be able to give anyone else your attention. Mm. Um, so that's kind of another, another tip. Um, but interior paint, I would say I like to use golden fluid acrylics. It comes in a squeeze bottle, so it's very easy to pour out. And the colors are beautiful. They have a nice range of colors. I would stay away from any tube paint. It's a mess and it's too much. Squeeze bottle is always the best for when you're working on uh, collaborative murals. Okay, here's a, a budget question. Yeah. What is a reasonable budget for a 10 foot by 220 foot mural? Ooh, that's really technical. Okay, <laughs> uh, 220 foot. So it, you know, it really, I can give you a number that I would charge, but it really, really depends. Like, it depends on the budget that the person has to offer you, right? Like, I don't, technically, I don't, I don't touch a wall for less than a thousand dollars because I have to get on a ladder. I have to facilitate. I have to do all of these things. So I normally don't do anything less than a thousand dollars. I would say for 220 feet, that's pretty long and 10 feet. So you wouldn't really need a ladder. You would need kind of a step stool, um, which is great because it doesn't seem like it's a lot, but going up and down a ladder every time you have to add paint or make a change, it burns out your legs. So the ladder always makes the price go up for me a little bit. That's why I love using a lift because they would just take me up and down. I don't have to stress my legs. Um, so I would say, you know, 220, you know, I would say anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000. But that's for me, where I am now in my career. I would say if you're in, your, in the early parts of, of your mural career, that maybe you ask for a little bit less. I always like to see what the person's budget is before I give a number. I never give a number until I first see what their budget is. Because if they tell me they only have $300, I refer somebody that, that will do it for $300. Uh, perhaps a young art student that wants the experience and needs some pocket change. Um, but if they give me a number like, oh, we have anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000, then I'll, I'll do a little bit of research on the organization. I'll see if there's a corporate entity involved. If there's a corporate entity involved, I'm always charging more because it means that they have corporate money. If it's a nonprofit arts organization, that is barely surviving and they really don't have the money, I tend to cut them some slack. Um, if it's a small business owner that isn't a corporate entity, but they're like a small bit, they're a corporate, but they're a small business, I, I negotiate with them based on what they have to offer in kind. So for example, I just did a roll down gate for a um, doggy daycare uh, center in Brooklyn and she had a small budget but she did also offer some doggy products because I have a dog plus free groomings. So I was able to get about six, $700 in kind donation to add to the thousand dollars she offered, which then made it, um, you know, made it about right for me. I could go on forever about budget <laughs> because yeah. I really, um, you know, you gotta be paid for the work you do. Otherwise, you're just going to burn yourself out. And so it's really important to make sure you add value to the projects that you're doing, um, especially if it's if you're not part of your school staff, if you're not doing it like under, like if you're an art teacher at a school, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a uh, complicated stuff, but yeah, it is. And that's anyone could reach out to me on Instagram if they have any questions that like they want to like ask I, i'm really open source i'm happy to help and what's your instagram name it's am at underscore nyc or at am underscore nyc and it's on the page right now that you guys are all looking at oh great um let's see what else um could we receive a handout with your suggestions for best materials and sealants um sure i can send a handout i can also just type it in the chat 
Um, let's see. Cortex is the sealant. And then um, kills is the primer, right? And then if you're doing any uh, latex paint, I would suggest bare. I like using bare. It's cheap, it's good, it works. And if you're doing uh, exterior mural, then you would use bare exterior, which is a little bit more pricey, but you need it if you're doing an exterior. Okay, let's see, what else? Um, someone is thinking about doing a fourth grade indoor project. Would you recommend doing it in school or as an after school enrichment? Hmm. After, you know, I find that after school kids don't take things like they're, they're out, they're done. They're done with their day. Um, when you do it in class, you, you're holding them accountable because you're giving them a grade for whatever it is. They have to be there. They have to be present. They're, they're there. They're in the seat. But if you're really looking to weed out the students that don't want to do art or don't want to participate, then I would say do an after school because then you'll get the kids that really want to be there. I like to work with kids that want to paint the mural. You know, when you run into having to work with students that don't really want to be there, it's sort of a pain to manage them. So it's almost like, you know what, if you don't want to be here, that's fine. You know, like, so there are benefits to both. Um, I would probably do after school for myself just for that reason, so that I get the kids that really wanted to paint. Hmm. Okay, I've got a question for you. It's, yeah. This is, this is my question. So um, have you ever had any issues with um, community members who like weren't part of the mural painting project um, having complaints about the, you know, the style of the artwork or the content of the artwork that you've had to deal with? And, and if so, how did you manage that situation? Yeah, so that's a great question, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> There's always some haters that are going to complain about something, right? And so we, I do run into that. Um, I try to be as diplomatic as possible by telling them that we're trying to do something positive for the community and working within, you know, with community members. It depends if it's collaborative, then I use that. Um, if it's just me working on a project, you know, most of the time when I'm working alone, I have my headphones on just to kind of, so that I could be in the zone and work and not be distracted. So much of my process is listening and really tapping into the environment that I'm in and making sure that I'm being sensitive to my space that I'm in. So when I'm painting, I really don't want to be distracted. So, you know, I try to prevent that by allowing the institution to kind of come in as a buffer for me. Oftentimes when I'm painting on a lift, they have to yell, I'm, I'm too high. So usually I have someone on the ground that can answer any questions. Like there's a great organization in, um, in Rochester called Wall Therapy. And they make sure when the artist comes that they have someone on the ground floor there to answer any questions that any, um, any community member might have. And they're trained to do so. Like they have like sessions that they have to, you know, they, they, they go to meetings to you know, to talk about how to deal with certain questions like that. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I just kind of like brush it off, whatever. I'll say something nice and I'll keep it moving. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's something that is relevant that I didn't see, like one community member came up to me and she was like, the hand looks kind of weird. And I was like, how so? And she goes, I think it's backwards. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm like an hour away from like a major unveiling with the Albright Knox Museum and the hand is backwards, literally the hand that was holding the seed. I had to get up on the lift and reverse the hand because sometimes I paint hands and feet backwards. So that is a situation where I invite comments and I'm like, okay, constructive criticism is important. Um, so, you know, it really depends. We had a question earlier, Alice, um, much, much earlier, if you just bear with me one second. On your Dream Keepers mural, is there, was there any conversation as to why the male figure's eyes were closed while the females were open? Yeah, so the, the title of the piece is Dream Keepers. 
So he was supposed to be somewhat introspective and sort of dreaming of a better, uh, more just society. Um, and so that was the reason. Just wanted to get that in there for the person. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I see a question here about some green green school. They have a green school and to make sure all materials meet the standards for our material usage. Um, does acrylic hold up? Any suggestions for inside? So yeah, I mean the you know using green products like you know I it's tough because acrylic is all plastic based. It's all polymer based. So. You know, I would say, unfortunately, there aren't any acrylics or paints that are permanent that are green, but you could, um, you know, all of the containers that you use can be compostable. Like sometimes I use egg cartons um, because I don't like to throw those egg cartons out. So you could use materials that are, you can upcycle materials. Um, I'm very conscious of making sure I reuse stuff and also your brushes you could find brushes that are environmentally friendly you're welcome for, for Valerie who just said thank you and Rachel any other questions um, it seems like they're slowing down um, Tony should we try and replay that video from earlier you bet. Give me one second. Let me just navigate to it. Oh, you're welcome. Everyone who's saying thank you, you're so welcome. And again, for those of you that just want to reach out to me and if you have any questions or, you know, or if you ever you're doing a mural and you need some advice, I'm really open source. I'm happy to take, um, you know, happy to advise anyone that, that needs it. Oh, there is one more question that we missed. Uh, someone is, uh, Ellen is asking if you have any Ohio Arts Council connections. Mm, I don't, I don't, but I could recommend, you know, if you want an Art Council connection, you go to the Art Council meetings and you meet the person, you go up to them, you talk to them, you tell them your ideas. People are very approachable um, when, when it comes to making their community um, better, right, or look better, or even incorporating uh, activities that empower communities. So I would say, you know, the way I do it is I just go to the meetings. I go to the art council meetings. I do research. I find out who the the president of the board of the art council is, and from that, then I'm able to be like, okay, now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, connect with them. And when we're all human beings, so. Usually, you know, if you approach someone in a kind and loving way, they're, they're receptive. But I don't have anyone in Ohio. I've been to Ohio once um, for a, a, a mural tour that uh, my husband was doing and we had RV through Cleveland and it was fabulous. I, I hurt my leg in, in Cleveland, but it was, it was a really great town. I had a, a lot of fun there. Um. Question about, I guess, the cost of a mural, meaning like the cost of materials, I think. Yeah. Uh, is there like a general range you can give? Yeah, so oftentimes, um, you know, I, I like, it depends on, first it depends, I should say it depends on how big the wall is, right? If it's a small wall where you don't need a ladder and it's, you know, it's about, you know, maybe a eight foot by 10 feet wall, you know, I would say it's about 500 to a thousand dollars. I like to always add on the line item a thousand dollars plus for the budget. If it's a large wall, you need more obviously, but I like to always put a thousand if it's small, if it's on the small end of a wall, because there's always contingencies. There's always stuff that comes up that you didn't think of or that you need, or, you know, there's lots of things you need. You need water containers, you need buckets, you need access to water, you need brushes, you need uh, spray paint, you need spray paint caps, you need the actual paint, you need containers for the paint, you need rags, you need to make sure that you're wearing a mask if you are spray painting, you need to make sure you have covering for your feet if you're wearing nice shoes or anything like that, or if the kids are wearing nice sneakers, that's a big thing. I often bring plastic bags and just have them put plastic bags on their feet you need trash bags and trash cans. So once you start to lay out all of the materials you need, it adds up. 
and then sometimes you forget things. So I always like to, you know, err on the, you know, like add a little bit, pad the budget a little bit for materials. But I would say for a small wall, anywhere between five to a thousand. For a larger wall, I would say anywhere from a thousand to three, four thousand. And materials, you know, a lift is also considered materials like a boom lift. So, you know, those are depending on, those could be anywhere from $200 a day and up. So that's something you would need to research. Thank you, Wendelin. I'm gonna try to play this video one more time. Okay. So give, give me a, a heads up if you're not able to hear it. I'm gonna try to do it through the presentation this time. Okay, cool. I'm so glad that worked that time. Yeah, thank you for replaying that. Yeah, so if I could just say, you know, again, it's really great when you can have the, anyone you're working with document the process because as a facilitator, you're more focused on making sure you're there and present to make the thing happen. So if you can, you know, designate a video media team before you even, you know, begin painting, it is so important, um, you know, and you, you have that as a keepsake forever and the students also have it and they can see, you know, what they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that the students made that video too. Yeah. Uh, so just a couple extra things. Uh, we're going to give away a free copy of our collaborative tape art book, which is another great approach to uh, collaborative mural making. It was created by uh, the tape art crew, otherwise known as Leah Smith and Michael Townsend. They've been doing murals with tape for, gosh, was it 30 years now? Uh, based out of Providence. And they've got a really cool method. And it's also a really fun book. It's kind of oversized, so you can actually flip the cover back and like work with students uh, using the book. So um, if you share a mural success story with Davis social media channels by Friday, June 12th at 5 p.m. Uh, we will select one post as the winner in, of a copy of the book. And that's, uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's the Davis Publications. Um, we also, uh, next Tuesday, June 16th, we have a photography webinar with our um, authors, Herman Joyner and Kathleen Moynihan, who wrote our Focus on Photography book. It's a really awesome photography resource that covers both traditional darkroom and uh, digital photography. It's got a lot of great technical stuff in it, as well as uh, teaching ideas. Uh, if you go to davisart.com free resources, you can see all of the topics for our other webinars. 
You can see uh, the recordings of the previous webinars. You can register for the upcoming webinars. Uh, there's also some free professional development sessions, lessons, and some videos. Uh, we also are doing a mail art show uh, with um, Frank Juarez in uh, Wisconsin. So uh, if you go to the mail art call to artists on davisart.com, um, you can send a physical mail small artwork to uh, Frank and he's going to post it in his gallery and we're going to have an online show. So it should be fun. Uh, try and get you guys off of uh, the technology for a little while, just at least long enough to do um, something with your hands. So, Rob, could I chime in, in real yes. quick? Absolutely. So well, another, another thing is um, I, I'm working right now with Davis to, uh, to produce a book on mural, on mural arts. And so in the next, uh, in the fall, you got, you all will be seeing um, a, a art, uh, it's, it, it'll be a deck card set um, of mural artists and uh, women artists. And so that's another resource that you, you'll have coming up for those of you who want to uh, teach your students how, about muralism. Absolutely. And we're very excited about that project. So stay tuned for more information from Davis and from Alice. Um, I think, is there another slide, Tony? Or that's it. That's it. Oh. Now it's just a great big thank you to everybody for joining us. And then even bigger thank you to Alice and Rob for presenting this wonderful information. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, but we can hang out in case anybody has any additional questions while we're here. <laughs>